Hey, Mohammed. Ahmad, are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Good, good. Yeah, okay. we are in business. I'll be the only two. <clears throat> right. I know Joe is having problem. Joe, have we a problem have been fixed? Okay. Right. And uh, you need to log into Chrome huh? browser. Yeah. So, Mohammed, it looks like um, Joe is having a, a small challenge there. The technical yeah. folks are helping him yeah, because he cannot see the join as a speaker button. Sorry? You got in? Yeah, let me get this yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Joe seems to have a challenge, bit of a challenge. Good afternoon. Yeah, hi Jag. Good afternoon. Jack, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Um there was um I had a message that uh, Congressman Khanna may not be able to make it. Oh, okay. Um, because uh, it coincided with a time when he had to speak to the house. So oh. he's rang my PA and said, look, he, they will do their best for him to join. But there was a risk that he may not be able to make it. Okay, okay. Yeah, I know. Congress is in session. Yeah. Yeah. And, and right now it's pretty critical time. With a few things are going on. Right. But we will do the best we can. Sure. Absolutely. So because we are going to be quite short of time, I will do away with um, sort of introductions because that will take otherwise five minutes. And everybody has the program. Everybody has the speaker bios. So I don't think it's a waste of time for me to introduce each one. I'll just say thank you to all of you for join in the panel tonight and then give some introductory remarks, set the scene, and then we move on. Is that right? Sounds good. Yep. So I guess I'll be leading off after you then. Uh, I will invite um, uh, everyone. Um, so yes, you, 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 you will lead after me. Yes. As in cricket, as I say, I'll be one down. <laughs> Yeah, the opening batsman. <laughs> he, is the, he is the opening batsman. <laughs> right. So I've got about four minutes of introductory remarks. Um, so that because they want all of us to do four minutes each. Right. Yeah, mine may not last four minutes, but it'll be long enough. Hi, Andre. Good evening, everybody. How are Good. you? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Yes, very well indeed. Good, good. We are waiting for one or two more, Joe Donovan and Jane Oates, um, and possibly Congressman Khanna. But I had a message from his PA to say that he may not be able to join. He may have to make a speech to, con to the House. So okay. depending on the timing, but we'll do the best we can. No problem. Did uh, any of you join the rest of the sessions today or not really? I haven't had a chance, unfortunately, no. I did one. Was it good? That was interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Again, I, apparently they produce uh, uh, a write-up afterwards because I saw it the last year, couple of years, and so I'll, I'll look through those. I'm sorry. Just what a message from Jane. She can't seem to join. I don't know why. Oh, I see her message there too, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see if my PA is on hand. Because <coughs> there's nothing I can do. Um, there's no real moderator switch that I can turn on or anything. Yeah, you don't have any technical control over matters here, yeah. Nothing. They, they just control it all centrally. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so I just got a message. Ro Khanna will join the call um, at 8.05 p.m. UK, so in about 20 minutes. And there is um, a person called Janti. Um, she is supposed to be the IT person. The technical person, yeah. You give that number to Joe Donovan as well. Which we did. Connected him. There. Again. Yeah, we did. And he's, he's um, they are working with him on that, on his connectivity. Hey, Andre, this is Morali Walaganti. Hello, Morali. Very nice to meet you. And thank you. Andre, I'm Jag Dalal. Uh, actually, I'm working with somebody from South Africa in a similar road. Oh, really? Yeah. The company is called Infabet. Okay, no, I don't know it. All right, where is it based in Johannesburg? Yeah, yes, it is. Okay, it is. all right. I, I'm in. The, I'm in. I'm in near Cape Town. In, yeah, okay. Well, actually, they have an operation in Cape Town as well. Okay. Uh, what, later on, I'll I'll contact you and, and put you in touch. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I've done some other work with them with uh, South Africa as well. So at some point in time, I'll connect up with you. Fantastic. Yeah. And and maybe we'll see you here when we can all move around the world again. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, somebody else has just joined. That's uh, Joseph, I think, yes. Joseph, yes. Joseph has joined as well now. And so we are waiting for Jane Oates. Um, she, she can't seem to join. So I've, I've given her... Um, uh, who had? Okay. Okay, so that's good. And uh, will we be there on standby for a comment? Hi, Joe. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good day. Yeah. 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 So Andre. Hi, Joe. Good luck to everybody that you might be late. Goodness. Perfect. Super. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Super. Cheers, thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> <You look> good <laughs> now. <laughs> Very good. I'm ready now. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness. I've learned in Zoom not to show anything below my face. <laughs> <laughs> Wisdom. So I mean, you know, uh, so where the setting is rather dark, um, because that's how it's supposed to be. So that's why maybe you see me very dark. It's not uh, deliberate. It's just the way the lighting is. But it's good that we were all able to navigate the technology and uh, beyond because it was quite complicated. Um, you couldn't go into it with any browser other than Chrome. Yeah, it's an interesting platform, I guess, quite a large one uh, at that. Yeah. So I, I, I saw the stats, and they said that there would be about 900 speakers today in a day. Right. Wow. That must be a record for any event. It's pretty impressive, eh? Yeah. 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 I wow. think being online, it makes it easier, I guess, than, you know, in, than a physical yeah. conference. But I would love to yeah, see how many signed up as participants because 900 speakers – there must be at least a ratio of five to ten per speaker, so maybe I don't know five or ten thousand people. Does yeah. it show anywhere? Does it show anywhere here how many attendees uh, no. on the call? No, it does on, it. on on uh, Cisco WebEx um, or on Zoom. You can see right. Um, the session I attended, they sort of made the comment of the number of people that had joined or signed up. So the moderator may have known that somehow. Okay, he, he could have been told in a private message. I yeah. certainly, I, I, I see nothing on my screen any different from I guess you guys would. Right. I'm afraid to touch my screen after I finally got in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it ain't broke, don't fix. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, where is there a nine-year-old when you need one? Yeah. <laughs> Precisely. Let it get right we are, in. We are two minutes past the start time, but I guess we wait at least for Jane to join. 
if you cannot by eight, then I guess eight UK time, then I guess we have to get started. Okay. In, in eight minutes. Okay. And you're still not seen, uh, Mohammed. I'm here. I can see you. Yeah. I know. I know you can see us, but we cannot see you. You're coming as dark. I'm very dark. As I said, it's the lighting yeah. in this room, sadly. It's a country house in Devon. And the light is on full blast, but that's how it is. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> is there any way? I can't. The people I, like I, to see the moderator, right? I know. Everybody does. They don't see us. Is there any can, other light you can move? When Nadia comes up, I'll try and get her to bring a lamp. Where is everyone located? Uh, Joseph, I'm in uh, South Africa, in, uh, just near Cape Town. Okay. Uh, I'm in the hut. I'm in Where Dallas. Dallas? Yeah. I'm in Hartford, Connecticut. Okay. I'm, I'm in Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, Mohammed is a nice uh, castle uh, in a mansion, castle kind of set up in <laughs> Devon, in uh, countryside, UK. Oh. Beautiful, beautiful setup. <clears throat> really? And a property on a 200 acre land with, uh, yeah. It's, it's, oh, it's a good uh, setting, I can't complain. We have 450 acres with a 50 acre deer park. The breeding season for the deer has just begun, so it's nice to see what's going on. We have a herd of white and a herd of red deer. Um, and did you enjoy us? I mean, come on, where did it come? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Plus, and peacocks and sheep, you name it, it's all here. No, Mohammed says, sorry, I'm on lockdown at the moment. Nobody can visit me, so that's a good excuse. Yeah, keep, keep everybody away. <laughs> I, I also, the situation in the UK isn't great. Uh, we look to be having a second wave. I just hope that we do not have a second lockdown, but it's heading that way. So, and I also learned that uh, in South Africa, during the lockdown, you could not have alcohol or cigarettes. Yeah, there was a. Well, you could you could get it uh, actually, Joe. You could definitely get it, but of course, it was all <laughs> underground. We yeah. created an amazing underground culture of uh, alcohol and cigarettes. I mean, believe me, it was just astonishing. The government lost. Billions of dollars of revenue, and yeah. and nobody missed a beat. So it was just the most it was the most ridiculous thing, actually. Yeah. Now yeah. we are uh, five minutes into the program now. Yes, yeah, so if there are people, uh, or yeah. listening, we can start. Yeah. So thank you very much, panelists, for being on this uh, panel, which is, as you know, called paving professional pathways for the disenfranchised. Uh, the the uh, program will be such that I will make a few introductory remarks and all of you will go on and talk about why this is of interest to you and what is your vision for how to solve this going forward. And after that, there will be some um, uh, questions and answers, but in a conversation style. So let me start by setting the scene here, if I may. Um, so there are decades when uh, nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. It seems that 2020 is very much falls into this latter category. We are now facing climate change on an existential scale, inequality on a colossal scale, um, and we are also now having to combat an erstwhile invisible enemy that cannot be seen or touched, but yet has forces in every corner of the globe. And this has wreaked the biggest economic, societal, and human disaster that we've experienced in a century. This enemy spares no one, however rich or powerful or famous you are. And if then, if, and then if that was not enough to endure, we have the death of George Floyd, leading to the global Black Lives Matter movement, which has laid down the bare racial divides that have highlighted the gap between the haves and have-nots. Some stark statistics for you to reflect on. The world's richest 1% have more than twice as much wealth as 6.9 billion people. The world's 22 richest men have more wealth 
than all the 325 million women in Africa. Almost half of humanity is living on less than $5.50 a day. Only four cents in every dollar of tax revenue comes from taxes on the wealth. The unpaid care work done by women is estimated at $10.8 trillion, three times the size of the tech industry in the world. A Faces of Power survey in the U.S. this year showed that 80% of the people in power are white. The Color of Power report in the U.K. this year identified 1,097 powerful roles. Of these, only 51 are filled by non-white people. This is an increase of just 15% since the last findings in 2017. The adage that death is the great leveler has been in circulation since Roman times. And since Roman times, it has been manifestly untrue, except in the sense that we are all mortal. There is little about death that removes the differences between people, especially between the rich and the poor. The pandemic is no exception. The wealthy have plenty of options for lockdown, Poor people have less space, less choice, and even less access to sunshine. They may lack the money to sit out the storm. While it is true that fighting a viral pandemic requires self-discipline from all of us, the sacrifices required of the wealthy are modest. The heavier burden falls on the poor. To say that we are all in this together is accurate only in the sense that generals and foot soldiers fighting the war are also in it together. Donald Trump has put his finger on it. When he was asked by why is it that well-known people were getting tested for coronavirus before others, the US president responded, perhaps that's been the story of life. Economic recovery, when it comes, will depend on the rapid return to work of hundreds of millions of workers. The owners of capital cannot function properly without them. It is in the interest of even the most hard-nosed plutocrat that the staff are healthy. People who have struggled to cope with lockdown will not make a well-motivated workforce. But it doesn't need to be like this. These levels of inequality and poverty are not inevitable. We can reform our economy to ensure that people, not profit, are at the heart of it. People have a, the right to a decent and dignified life, free from poverty, free from fear of the cost of falling sick or struggling with childcare costs. Work should be flexible and secure, and women and girls should be paid fairly and given equal opportunities. This could be a massive step towards creating safer, more equal and happier societies which benefits everyone. We can fight inequality and beat poverty for good if we come together and demand action. Tonight we have six very distinguished speakers who will, sh who will share their ideas of how to chart proper pathways to prosperity for the disenfranchised. Thank you very much. I will now call upon our panelists to uh, address in four minutes why and how they're connected to this issue and share their vision for the future. May I call upon Jagdish Dalal first, please. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for the invitation. The whole idea of a disenfranchisement and people getting left behind I was brought up, in, when I grew up in India, my grandfather and my great-grandfather were very much sold on that concept and actually created an educational program for the poor children. They established schools, they established scholarship programs, including a scholarship program to have students go from India to other countries for their further education. I think that the that has been kind of, stood into me in my blood. My sister, uh, who unfortunately passed away not too long ago, started uh, an organization 
to really empower women. Empower women in the villages who economically could not be independent. And so her program was to try and have the women become enough educated, enough cognizant of the financial aspects of the business so that when they have a local business in their own house, they could make the money and still keep it for themselves and use it wisely. And she did that for a number of years. So to me, the whole concept of disenfranchisement, people getting left behind have been from my birth and from a from long time ago uh, and can completely sold on, on that concept. So when I was asked the question uh, as to who falls within the disenfranchised category, I sort of came and started thinking about it that to me, the term disenfranchisement happens when the diversity in the society is not recognized. I think what we have done is that we have defined diversity narrowly as it suits the different places. So when we go further in our dialogue, I'll be happy to kind of set some more light on the concept of disenfranchisement, what it means to me, and what does that do into the future. So thank you for asking me to join the panel, and I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jagdish. Um, can I now ask uh, Joe Donovan to share um, his, uh, his, what connects him to this issue and what's his vision as to how we might address the problem? Sure. Thank you for having me serve on this panel. I appreciate it. When I look at what the pandemic has done, a lot of times a pandemic, a disaster of some kind will kind of energize a movement that's already taken place. So one of the things that we look at in Mississippi is how do we move Mississippi from a primarily agrarian or large manufacturing company or state to one that really focuses on digital and knowledge-based education. And when you look at the ability to um, pack up a skill set and with it, have it be exceptionally portable where you can move around at different places, it becomes much easier when you look at a state like Mississippi. We started, we started focusing on digital education in remote areas. When you figure you put a factory in place, for a factory what you need is a tremendous amount of infrastructure. If you want to put a high-tech coding-based or digital-based business in a small community, you can put one just about anywhere. All you need is a little bit of space and broadband internet. So it allows you to um, spread the kind of spread the wealth a little bit. It allows you to take a whole skill set and teach it to a group of people that are just as able to learn as anyone else. So what we've done is we've taken the core skill sets that you need in digital education, uh, that's artificial intelligence, uh, full stack coding, content for augmented reality, virtual reality, and focus those skill sets just as you would have welding skill sets in the 1940s, 1950s. You're teaching a skill. You're teaching a skill that's very portable, which the other skills were not. So you're teaching people a portable skill that has a high level income. Most of, most of the, the people that we see that come into, our, come into our cutting academies, again, we focus a significant amount on minorities. So you get somebody that was working in a fast food restaurant whose career trajectory was 25000 a year total. They go out now with a new skill set after 10 or 11 months, and they make $50,000 a year with a career pathway of maybe 100000 a year. We find we can do this in the smallest towns as long as they have the, a minimum amount of utility resources. Again, that's broadband internet is the most important. This is how you transform a state or an economy, and that's basically what my role is at MDA, Mississippi Development Authority, is how do we include all the people that were not included in the first two industrial revolutions. So that's my focus, and that's what I get up every morning and focus on doing, is how do I take that group of society and elevate them to where everybody else has been? Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. I will now turn to Murali, who I've known for a long time. Murali, 
you were a very successful senior IT executive. You left that job or left those jobs, high paid, high skilled, and you decided to turn your focus on the disenfranchised. What is it that motivated you to go and target this community? What has been your experience so far? And what is your vision for how to solve this issue going forward? Right. First of all, thank you, Mohammed, for uh, having me on this panel, um, esteemed, along with the esteemed panelists, co-panelists. Uh, nice meeting you all, uh, co-panels, uh, panelists. And uh, yes, um, before I talk about what motivated me and uh, what has been done, let me just define the word disenfranchised, what it means to me first. Um, any anyone who's been disconnected from employment uh, to me is a disenfranchised individual. Uh, they disconnected from employment for many reasons. Uh, people who have been disconnected because the lack of education. That's because they cannot could not afford the education. And people who have been uh, forced to become homeless or uh, become come out of the foster system and not able to get access to education um, people who are on uh, artistic spectrum you know they have a limited social skills uh, they may have a education but still disconnected from employment because of lack of skills social skills people who are victims of domestic violence particularly women you know who've been thrown on the street uh, more often with children you know and who have been disconnected, not able to stand on their feet. So there are a number of these um, young adults in the society today in the US uh, who, whose numbers run into millions. In fact, there are 36 million uh, young adults between the age of 18 and 35 who do not have a four year college degree, you know, again, for the reasons we talked mentioned before. So these, these are the folks who fall under this disenfranchised category. And um, the whole idea is so how do we connect them with the skills? Um, the irony is the conventional wisdom says that these undereducated or underskilled resources can only do low skilled jobs, you know? Um, and so the market basically industry brushed them off saying that they're not good for any, you know, um, higher and skills jobs. The conventional notion is that many technology jobs require a college degree. And, uh, and as a result, uh, the, as the um, industry is looking for people who have college degrees and skills to fill those jobs, uh, high tech jobs, uh, and not able to find adequate, uh, as a result of that, there are 1 million, close to 1 million uh, vacancies in high tech um, industry that are unfilled uh, today, you know. And uh, so that's a conventional notion. And the conventional model is even if they want to train some of these folks uh, and provide them with uh, the skills, but the, the model is they take, even they go to the rural communities or any of these communities where the high population of these disenfranchised. They train them, they lure them to the big cities and give them jobs into those, uh, you know, their organizations in, in the big cities. And these are all high density and high cost metros. And these people who would migrate from these communities will not be able to sustain, live a, have a sustainable livelihood or are, are able to uh, lead as a quality of life. At the same time, their families are broken because they're not getting moral support and all. So these are the some of this conventional thinking that exists today, unfortunately. So the whole idea is uh, when when I embarked on this journey of creating jobs, employment opportunities, or professional careers, I would say, to this disenfranchised, the whole idea is to how do we challenge this conventional thinking in the society around these undereducated and underskilled uh, resources particularly, especially blacks and Hispanic communities and other minority communities. How do we challenge and disrupt uh, these conventional assumptions? Um, so, so the idea is rather than one is there is, we know that everybody has talents, 
but they don't have the opportunities. And these folks are not looking for a charity handouts. They're looking for opportunities. So the whole idea is why don't we create technology jobs? Uh, if these people are, some of them are, can be skilled uh, and it's proven that one, you know, the organizations which are trying to skill them and bringing them to cities to get new jobs, it's proven that they can with the, uh, adequate training, they can be actually given the skills required to fill these jobs. So the whole idea is why do we need to bring the people to the jobs? Why can't we bring the jobs to the people? With that an idea in mind, started this initiative called Rural Shows in India, where set up the technology centers in the rural areas, take the rural youth, train them and give them jobs there and get the work outsourced to uh, our centers and deliver the work from those centers so that they can stay where they are, don't have to leave their families and, uh, and, and, and build a professional career path for themselves. Been done that uh, for about 10 years you now the has scaled to 13 centers with three, more than 3000 people employed. But in the last 10 years, we had more than 11,000 folks went through the system, you know, employed by us at certain point in time. And after three, four years of working with us, building the skills, building the professional career experience, then they move up in the career ladder to become managers, supervisors, and leaders, and they go and join the mainstream. Similarly, now three years ago, we started the similar model, we brought that model to US. I moved back to the US um, and started this initiative, setting up these technology centers in inner cities, in rural communities, and take those young adults, train them, give them jobs. People who generally has a high school diploma or a QD or equivalent you know, skills, train them and give them jobs there. And we're getting the work outsourced to us from the companies and we're delivering this work from this, uh, send these centers. And these people are able to do high quality work. They're able to match the quality of the, the educated urban youth doing in the cities uh, and uh, low attrition and uh, and high motivational you know, levels among this, uh, these folks because they don't have to leave their families and still maintain that. So, so they, they, this is what, when I see this, the people who are, you know, who was otherwise working in a fast food restaurant, even with a four year college degree, but the jobs are not there in the rural community within hundred mile radius, working at a fast food restaurant or a store clerk in Walmart or one of the stores. Now they're able to actually learn the high end skills, build the, you know, skills like robotics process automation and all this, and able to deliver the work, high quality work. When I see that, then that actually motivates me and wanting me to do more and more of this. So that is the journey we are on. We want to scale this across the country in the US, have dozens of the centers, each center employing you know, 300, 400 people and, um, and uh, essentially prove to the market, to the, prove to the industry that the people can be trained and the jobs can be given brought to the places where they are actually live rather than bringing them to the jobs. So that's the whole idea. And um, um, so, yeah, and it's been proven well and success and and we, we are confident that we can scale this model. Thank you, Mohamed. Thank you very much, Murali. So we also had Congressman Ro Khanna on our panel. Um, he had to sadly vote uh, in the House. The vote is um, told going on right now. I'm told that he should be with us in the next five or ten minutes. Um, so let's continue our panel, and then when he comes, he will join. So can I now ask uh, Jane Oates um, to say a few words about what is it about this um, issue or this, uh, this uh, task of how to pave professional pathways? Why is she interested? What's her... A touch point to this issue and what's her vision as to how this can be solved going forward. Jane, Thank, the you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with all of you. Rarely do I get to be in a room with so many like-minded people. Uh, Working Nation really was created as a nonprofit media entity to tell the stories of what you're describing. 
but to tell everyday people through video and written articles where the programs are that can get them from where they are right now, whether they're 18 and entering the job market or whether they're 45 and just been dislocated. How do we show them that people who look just like them have been able to make transitions into good paying jobs and really career pathways? These people, you know, need programs that have direct connections with employers so that they know when they get the skills or the degrees that they're working toward, there's a job at the end of it. And working adults, unlike many younger people who still have the benefit of being supported by their families, working adults need specific support systems. What are those supports that the working adults who come into training programs need in order to be successful? Some great measures have been done. You know, the staffing agencies have done wonderful things. Uh, apprenticeships have been wonderful so people can earn money while they're learning on the job. But clearly, a working adult needs to have something that pays them, especially when they've been working in jobs, as many of you have described, that are low pay and really don't have the clear skill set sets to match them to a career. And finally, I would say to you that this this concept of having employers involved throughout a public private partnership is really the only way we're going to make significant impacts and gains for the people who are most disenfranchised. They can't afford to go to school full time. They can't afford to wait weeks and months to get enrolled in a program. They need to start today. So I look forward to the conversation and thanks again for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Jane, for those remarks. We will continue discussing those when we come to the Q&A. Uh, but let me now invite um, Andre to talk about his um, attachment to this issue and his vision. He comes from my favorite country of South Africa, and his experiences there are absolutely amazing. Andre, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mohammed, and actually wonderful to be on the panel with all of you. So, so I, I, I understand and agree and hear everything that's being said is crucial and critical. Um, my little curveball comes in the form of the child. Uh, I really believe that this global crisis, because let's forget the word pandemic, I think this crisis that we have partly plunged ourselves into has given rise to a greater degree of disenfranchisement than we could ever have calculated uh, six, six, eight months ago. The problem with that is reframing this and regenerating where we are. And I think we have to look a lot deeper and a lot differently at the issues that we face. So the late Sir Ken Robinson had created understanding in a, in a broad uh, swath of people around the world, the fact that education as we know it was perhaps not quite as guided as we thought and perhaps was not as relevant as we thought. So the two most important arenas in the globe that I believe need urgent attention and the, and the, and the, the background and the history is all there maternal health and then early childhood education without these two elements you know every single one of us has passed through a phase of early childhood education the whether it was daycare whether it was our mother whether it was a, an assistant whether it was a parent or grandparent those first five years of life dictate your life outcomes they dictate how each of us sitting here today how have we turned into the people we've turned into and been guided in large part by those early years so what I believe the problem is, is that we need to maintain the regular education systems. We need to maintain job creation. We need to maintain economic growth. But if we do not focus on the investment that, you know, Jim Heckman, the Chicago-based Nobel economist, he has for decades been an advocate of the fact that the single greatest investment any country can make and the most cost-effective investment, he reckons that the return, the, the return on investment is 13 to 14 percent. My question is, and it, I, I say this with enormous deference to all of us here and anybody listening, uh, generally middle-aged to older males and largely white males have made decisions over the last 100 to 150 years on where the world should go and how we should maintain and run ourselves. The average middle-aged and elderly man knows very little about the development of a child, not because it was purposeful, not because it's negative, it's just how, how our circumstances have been. Mothers and women have had to do this job, and it is the most important and critical job. So we're not just facing a deficit of work and money. We're facing a deficit of human values, and those values are not recreated at the age of 15. 
They're not created at 16. They're not created at 25. If we don't love and, and cherish and, and allow independence, the gender equity issues start in early childhood. Racial issues start in early childhood. We coach and train our children to be who they become. And the onus rests on us as adults now, given this crisis, to truly understand that without placing the appropriate amount of focus on early childhood education, we will never change the long-term capacity of humankind to really address these issues fundamentally. So our work, we're using the Petri dish of the Western Cape and Stellenbosch is a town which is the highest Gini coefficient in the world. We have the highest fetal alcohol syndrome in the world. We have the highest gender-based violence in the world. And we are in the process of training hundreds and thousands of teachers in the world's finest Montessori teacher training method. Because I believe that if we're able to showcase this outcome, the outcomes we've seen in the space of two years are monumental. So I always say to folks, we need to have a hundred year vision. So I believe that if we don't give the prerequisite amount of effort, time and money to early childhood, we only have ourselves to blame. So thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. So we're still waiting for congressmen, but let's just uh, go on to part two of the um, of the panel, which is um, I will pose four or five questions depending on time. I will pose the questions initially to one of the panelists, but then this is supposed to be a conversation, so everybody should chip in. So we've just heard that um, disenfranchised men can mean different things to um, different people. On the one hand, we've talked about people that are not in employment. On the other hand, we've talked about people that have not been educated. Um, but these are issues that relate to um, economic power. Beyond that, there are also questions about whether it is fair to say that the way the world is structured today, and I, I read out excerpts from the Color of Power report, the Face of Power report, that suggest that if you are a white male, then you are definitely enfranchised. And if you are a black female, then you are somewhat disenfranchised. So to what extent is the definition also dependent on what's your gender, what's your color, which community come, you come from, and are the solutions um, the same for all of these, or are these different solutions we have to look at? So that I get, uh, let me get Jagdish to um, sort of tackle that first, and then we please chip in. This is the conversation now. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's sort of interesting when you kind of raise that as a question. I decided to kind of go dig deeper into what creates disenfranchisement, because if we don't learn from the history, it'll repeat itself. And so when I said I began to look at it, and I said one of the reasons disenfranchisement happens is when we don't recognize the, the diversity. The diversity we have in the community, diversity we have in the society. And in this diversity, I go with a much broader definition. And I know you all have brought up the part of the definition, which is really deals with the color, the sex, the national origin. But I also kind of include things like ethnicity, gender identity, upbringing, physical attributes, values, political and personal uh, beliefs. These are all diversity that create a society which kind of again is excluded when someone else says that's not us. Or there, or there are, as you said, that there are leaders who have taken a stand. That definition of disenfranchisement or people left behind is limited. And to me, that needs a much broader definition. Because when I look at it, when I think about it, the history has shown that there are really three ways disenfranchisement happens. The one is naturally. I mean, there are parts of the world where the resources do not exist. And when those resources do not exist, there are people that are left behind because they cannot sustain themselves. And they cannot have a life that's similar to anyone else that's been enjoying it in, in the rest of the world because they don't have the resources. The second way that happens is, is really circumstantially. Now, this is where the pockets of disenfranchisement happens because the community is left behind. I think we've seen it in Appalachia and parts of the United States and or even parts of Amazon in Brazil where economically they're left behind simply because no one had made an investment there. What, what uh, 
what's been done with the rural shorts and people shorts, he has paid attention to thinking that why are these people left behind economically because they did not have an option otherwise. And the third is we cannot, we cannot ever avoid politically motivated disenfranchisement. Unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of that where the politically, they're sep separated. We've gone through the disenfranchisement of women in the lack of voting in the UK, in the, in the US. And we've gone through disenfranchisement of the voting for the blacks in the U.S. That's a political motivated. And if you don't really, as a group, as leaders, think about the cause that creates disenfranchisement, solutions may be very narrowly offered. So I'm one of those that believes that in order to really address the, the issue of disenfranchisement, we really have to think much broader. And so what are the causes and can we go directly at the root cause that's causing the disenfranchisement? And is there a way to kind of address that? Because if we don't do that, the impact on the society as a whole is going to be like what's happened in the past in the Roman Empire, in the, in the old English Empire, in the old Chinese Empire, where the people then get against the system, get against the few people who controlled their future. And as a result, all of them, end up suffering. And I think we're seeing some of that here in the U.S. right now. We're seeing some of that in the other parts of the world where the people that are disenfranchised are taking the streets, are taking uh, something that they really don't want to do if they had the opportunity. So to me, we have to look at disenfranchisement, the reasons, the cause, and can we really address what's the root cause that's causing it and can we address it as a group, as an individual, because it takes all of us to really address that as an issue. Hopefully that sort of leads the conversation. Yeah, Andre, um, your country went into a program of reverse discrimination. Um, did that help in terms of addressing color issues, gender issues, and the issues for the uneducated? Unfortunately, Mohammed, at the moment, no. Uh, we've, we've seen an enormous corruption issue here, which is uh, just sunk the boat in another way altogether. So no, I think what's happened is power has corrupted uh, and it has certainly been partly along racial lines, but I think we've seen an incredible shortcoming of the current government to recognize that money needs to be spread. And in fact, the onus rests on government to ensure, as we've just heard, that we all need to collectivize our approach to making sure that everybody's uplifted, that women and children are placed first in the line. So I think we, we've not done a very good job of that after the first 25 years of, of democracy and freedom. Sadly. Um, Jane, what, what do you feel about what's going on in the U.S. at the moment? Um, is this something that is reversible or would it take time to, um, to change mindsets? Because it's a very serious problem. It looks from the outside for us that the country is broken, it's hugely divisive, and there are no real plans on how to bring it all back together again and function as you were when I used to live in New York as a very harmonious, blind community. You know, I, I think you're right when you say this is the most uh, divided our country has been in my lifetime. And I think it. I have to be optimistic and think we will be able to resolve these problems. We have come back after other things from an, our own civil war. Uh, but I think the pandemic did uh, so much to pull the Band-Aid off, all the things that had been hidden, all the inequities in opportunities. Opportunity. So I, I hope that we can get uh, leadership at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level who can heal the country. And the way to do that is to provide an equal opportunity platform. Um, Joe, um, Mississippi has been hit very hard. Um, how do you see the, um, the impact of the pandemic? Will it be business as usual when we come out of it? Or is this a genuine chance for a reset to happen? Um, or do you feel that we were already resetting and the pandemic is only going to accelerate the resetting? I believe we were already resetting. So I think the pandemic just gives made significant changes in our healthcare system. For Andre's line, when it comes to prenatal health and just 
uh, early infant health. We'd spend a lot of time and a lot of research dollars in the first 18 months of life and looking at how the different neuropathways are formed much earlier than anyone ever dreamed. Uh, so we saw some significant increases in education. Uh, Mississippi has taken a, a whack in some of the, the urban areas, but we're primarily a, a rural state. We have 3 million people you know, spread out over a, a fairly large uh, landmass. I mean, that's, we're not quite a borough in New York, but so it's, it's a little easier for us to, to kind of pull things together. Uh, you know, Mississippi really isn't, it's really not a state, it's really a club, but we're just trying to get more people into the club. Uh, but education is our driving factor. It's a, uh, but it's not. It's not going to be a post-secondary education the way we're used to seeing it. Um, Riley in, in People Shores has done an amazing job in North Mississippi and is one of our our absolute shining stars, uh, showing us how we can do things differently. But you know, we, when you look at digital education and you focus on first soft skills. But to focus a lot on soft skills, we have a generation that missed the vote on soft skills that you have to show up for work, that you're nice, you're, you know, you, you're nice to the person next to you. Um, you know, the, so we spend a lot of time teaching soft skills. Then we, then we focus on, again, those very specific skills that you need for that job. So it's almost a 21st, 22nd century version of um, vocational education. But it, because the skills are so portable and they pay so well and those markets are simply rapidly increasing, I think uh, we, we certainly can get there much quicker than we had before. You come from a state that has a great river follow, flowing in it. Uh, if you look at most cities and states that have got rivers, they are by far the most thriving and the most prosperous. Why is it that Mississippi has been left behind? What went wrong? I think, you know, and we talked a little bit um, about Mississippi, about the Civil War. Um, Mississippi was the the wealthiest state in the Union in, in 1860. Uh, we had some very unfortunate choices in, in 1861, and, it, and Mississippi just never really recovered from those for the first 150 years. Um, so I think it, it changed the economy. We never really caught up to the rest of the world. Uh, now in the last 20 years, 25 years, we certainly have, have made some significant progress. But that really was, was a defining moment. We just never really picked ourselves up from until just recently. And as a state, have you um, created programs that are going to work, as I think Jane was saying, in public-private partnerships to ensure that this is a burden that is shared between the private sector and the public sector. There are incentives in place to help redress some of these inequities of the past. Yeah, great question. We have some. We're still working on additional ones, but we found through the use of apprenticeship programs that the standard educational system didn't work. We had to have the the um, employers embedded in it in our our computer coding systems. And education that you know the midterm and final exams are outside industry experts coming in and looking at the portfolios of the the students that have gone through that process so not only do they get exposure to um, the industry standards right then and they they go to school in an industry setting but that's also kind of a running 11 month interview process you know our, our placement rate out of our first three cutting academies uh, prior to the pandemic was 100%. Um, you know, this, with, the, with, the, uh, with the pandemic, hiring has slowed down somewhat, but we see that picking back up pretty rapidly. But no, the industry partnerships are absolutely the key to these working. And uh, People Shores is a great example of that. Well, I want may I jump in uh, uh, just to kind of add to what uh, Joe was saying, that the as a long-term technology executive, one of the concerns I have and continue to have is the way technology is progressing, we might be creating more and more disenfranchised people because the new technology is going to disintermediate a lot of jobs which don't have the skill. 
So what Joe is suggesting and what, what the people source and rural source are doing is really bringing in the new technology so they're not left behind in the next generation. I think they're, they're gonna, yeah. we're going to yeah. have a group of people that are left behind now. I absolutely agree with that. But the problem is that, um, so there is a report that McKinsey's and Boston Consulting Group and others have said that um, for every job that is lost because of the change in the future and nature of work, there will be new jobs created in the AI and artificial learning, artificial intelligence, robotic space and all that. And by and large, that work is going to be better paid. Um, and so the question is, how do you start to skill that from now rather than wait before it's too late. And so some of the ideas that have been paraded, and I was really um, sad that Congressman Khanna isn't there because the question I was going to put to him is that his state is the fourth richest in GDP terms globally, bigger in GDP than even most Western European countries in size. And he has got the tech companies there. The tech companies are the ones that are disrupting the work and jobs as we know it today. Why are we not looking at imposing a wealth tax on them to take this money and use it to skill people who are now going to be out of jobs because of their disruption? And Mohammed, that's such a good point. You know, as we were forced to switch to online learning, and Joe, I'm sure you had this happen in Mississippi, all over the country, we found school districts where children not only didn't have the hardware, the laptops, or the, the, the pads, you know, to kind of do schoolwork, they didn't have the broadband access. So mm -hmm. if they couldn't get access to broadband, they were unable to continue their education. That clearly is going to keep them from getting the digital fluency that they need to participate fully in the 21st century economy. I, I think that that's, you know, I just wanted to add that all of these, uh, I love what hearing about people shows and Joe, what you're saying about Mississippi is so fascinating. One of the things that we all need to understand, though, is uh, three anecdotes very briefly is speaking to the dean of education at Stellenbosch University, Professor Madiba. His greatest concern is the intake of, of students into the first year. The standards are dropping based on the general education systems that are prevailing. I'm speaking to the headmaster of a school in Johannesburg, a public school, very successful school. His greatest concern is the kids entering first grade do not have the capacity. They're, they're, they're less capable than previous.